Namaste. Welcome back everyone to Ripples in the Sand. This podcast is brought to you by the folks at Drifting Sands Highbun, where we invite Highbun poets who have appeared in the journal to both read and discuss their poetry. This is your host Sangeeta Kalarikal. To our regular listeners, thank you and hope you have subscribed to our YouTube channel so that you won't miss out on our activities. Do like, love, comment, uh, spread the word of poetry to your friends. Our guest today, our guest is a musician and award-winning poet with four published free verse poetry books. Um, uh, while these days she exclusively writes in the haikai tradition, and is a highly respected and widely published hygien. In 2021, she was presented in A New Resonance, 12 Emerging Voices in English Language Haiku. In her words, it is as if haiku chose her. Jo has a strong voice in the haibun form, with her latest work appearing in Contemporary Haibun Online, Drifting Sands, and the Haibun Journal. She has also been an editor for the Drifting Sands Haibun. Folks, please welcome to the podcast, Joe Balistreri. Good afternoon, Joe. Thank you. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, so great. you also live in the mid- Midwest, right? I mean, yes. I just wanted to. Okay, super. We're in the same time zone, folks. So which is this, nice. this is, which is definitely nice, which is yes. definitely nice. Yeah, yeah. So um, I uh, also wanted to check um, one thing with you. Uh, it's been extremely hot to hear. Has it been the same there? But close to 100 years. Extremely hot. And today, it is extremely rainy. (laughs) Good, good. We need the rain. It feels like hot rain. So I was looking at your uh, your website and uh, saw a lot of lovely uh, work. You so you went from a very successful mainstream free verse poet to almost exclusive haikai tradition. So what was the lure for you in these forms? Well, originally, I think I just wanted to learn a form, not knowing what a form was in haiku. I thought, oh, Mm -hmm. I will learn a sonnet form. Oh, I will learn a villanelle. No, haiku is three lines, and so it was very challenging. I liked the challenge, and then I got to love the simplicity of trying to get the thingness of something and how I felt about it. It was a very emotional thing because here's something so simple that is so abundant. How do you do that? Mm-hmm. And it made me aware of my life in a way that mainstream poetry did not. And so it became almost very subtly, but it became a way of life. Mm. And it's a spiritual path almost for me today. Mm. It is how I want to live my life. So it went from a form and a challenge to this all-encompassing way of living Mm. that I cannot think of going without. I think haiku. Mm. I dream haiku. Uh. And even when I'm not writing, that's always there. Right now I'm trying to write a haiku in my mind about the way you look. That is funny. <laughs> it's just everything. It's the way I live. Yeah. So it was yeah. when I finally, I, I write, write very few free verse poems. I love haiku. I cannot imagine mm-hmm. my life without it. Mm-hmm. So would you say uh, it's not just a form or poetry? It's actually 
forcing you to be aware of the surroundings yeah. and almost breathe haiku, right? It's a breath. It is breath. Definitely yeah. breath. And it went from just, oh, I'm going to learn this form. Well, if it had stayed there, I would have missed the whole thing. Right. right. But my, it captured my mind. It captured my spirit. It captured my soul, which I consider a little different than spirit. Right, right, right. It's a... It's the way I live. It's the way it is breathing. Mm. It is breath. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. just thinking about it makes me excited. <laughs> so, um, our our listeners would probably there might be some in our among our listeners who are just novices, just starting to write haiku. What's your advice to them? I mean, since we're talking about haiku, almost like a journey, right? Yes, it is a journey. And I, reading and reading and reading, at first I would have to say, as a beginner myself, I did not understand haiku at all. Mm -hmm. I thought, what mm -hmm. is this? But I kept reading and I kept reading. And then after a while reading um Higginson and reading Lee Garga and reading to amplify these little gems. Suddenly one day I read something, it might have been Busan. Oh, this is the most beautiful thing I've seen. I felt it inside of me. This mm -hmm. is who. So I think reading is so important. Having a mentor is so important. Mm. Yep. Having people that you can speak with that are better than you are, there's always somebody better. And therefore, you can always learn more. That's so, so true. So profound, though. But it is, it is a fantastic piece of advice, Joe. Thank fantastic you. piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. So I hope yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as a poet, uh, so haiku is one, the haibun. What is it about haibun that has attracted you? Well, haibun has everything. <laughs> the form itself. You don't just send in a poem and attach a haiku to it. That uh, is yeah. the haibun. But the yeah. haibun is telling a story. It has that narrative to it. And then you use poetry techniques. I mean, those are very important. You can use yeah. some of the same techniques in the storytelling. But now we get to the exciting part, too. You have a haiku. And more and more for me, the haiku is absolutely elemental to the haibon because mm -hmm. it adds another dimension. And particularly if you get used to using, and I don't always, a Kegel, which gives the high boon resonance, emotional resonance. Um, and so you can tell a little side story with the haiku. It, it can relate it in some way. It doesn't have to, it, it should not um, take anything from the narrative any of the mm -hmm. same words, but you write yeah. this haiku that adds this di different dimension. And then for me, when I'm all done, I think, oh, I have a title. I can do something exciting with a title that is again another dimension to the high bone. So we mm. have three different ways, all in one, of telling a story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then there's right. importance in that I guess you have to ask yourself, what does this mean? Yeah. That's really important. And maybe finally, is there a, an enduring quality? Is there a universality about what you're doing? Right. But every single element contributes and every single element is important. 
Now, for me, lately, I've been right. When I see a high boon, I go to the haiku first. I want to see if it's a good haiku. Wow. I don't know. If, yeah. I mean, that's my way. But there's yeah. Many yeah. Ways, so I would always yeah. stress that. But <laughs> although I write a lot of Monaco, I yeah. also like the idea more and more. I can't explain that enough of three utterances so that you have for an example mm -hmm. from one of my own high boon that i will read today that the um it says first notes that's a separate utterance right we take mm -hmm. a breath after that first mm -hmm. note honeysuckle scented that's another utterance, another piece of the puzzle. The third one, by the sun. Beautiful, yes. I see what you mean. Yeah. And I see what you mean. Yeah. The high so a, just, it offers so much. But it yeah. also asks so much. There's mm -hmm. a great responsibility in, in writing a high bone and asking yourself, does this matter? Is this something that other people can relate to? And the big question, of course, can it endure? Does right, it endure? right. Yeah. And timelessness. Yeah, timelessness. Good. Yes, thank yeah. you for that conciseness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt. I love that one. So, <laughs> so yeah, I was just wondering. So, uh, how about we uh, start with the poem of yours? Uh, I mean, the one that you just uh, quoted from Timber uh, is very close to my heart, you know, because it's about the earth. Um, so, before you uh, go ahead and uh, sing, read your high bone, can you tell our uh, reader, uh, listeners, what your inspiration or motivation was behind writing this particular yes. piece? I, I can tell you exactly. I'm a musician. And all my life, I wanted to play a Bach on my programs. I was a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. And back in that day, nobody wanted Bach. But I insisted on Bach. I love Bach. So anyway, I got the chance to have a harpsichord made and went to yeah. Massachusetts and chose every single part of that harpsichord the wood, the keyboard, um, the way it was pitched, everything. And I walked wow. into this warehouse, which it was, and all these little apprentices, I still see them with their aprons running around with the wood and the smell of the wood. wood. And so it was everything to me to be able to see this wood from the forest and we're now not, we're doing honor to the wood. We've cut yeah. it, yes, but its music will continue yeah. in an instrument. So that was what prompted wow. me to, wear, to uh, write this. Yeah. Would you like to read it, please? Do you want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Timber. Yes. Actually, timber. Tumber. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. That's the pronunciation. Yes. <laughs> so, in a dusty old warehouse on the Charles River, wood sings. Melody vibrates within the Norway spruce, waiting to be shaped into soundboards. The smell is intoxicating. We watch men cut out keyboards while others apply ebony to the natural keys, ivory to the sharps. Aproned apprentices touch the wood with reverence. The master points to piles of satinwood, basewood, rosewood, pine, says it is important not to forget the wood has known 
only the music of dense forests and high mountaintops, of the creatures that lived within its shelter, and the elements that shaped it. It is our job, he says, to soothe the tree's spirit. First Notes Honeysuckle Scented by the Sun Oh, so, so beautiful. You write so beautifully, especially your, your prose is like, it is poetry as well. Thank you. <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you. So, so you've been... Um, You've been an editor for High Boon Issues uh, yes. several times. So what is it that you like to see in a High Boon from an editor's point of view? Well, first of all, we have to be very honest. I don't know much about editing. I'm going to say that right up front. But what I like to see is a flow. I like to see how the parts help each other. Mm -hmm. um, I like the haiku to be good, mm -hmm. but I think the flow, and again, what does this mean? Yeah. What are you telling me? Can I take this home with me? Will I remember it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I guess I, I need to do more editing, actually. And I don't have the time to do more editing. <laughs> but you know, you learn so much from the people. Um, mm. And so I learned a lot editing. And I learned to recognize that flow and how you could make it better with some concision and with some turning around of a phrase and just all kinds of things. But I guess if I had to say one word, I didn't realize I was such a talker because I'm not usually. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> I, I think when, I, when we're in a, a situation like this, I just, I get so excited and so enthused that it just all comes out. But I love being an editor, <laughs> even though I oh, oh, super, super. Yeah, you get to read a lot of poems, right? I mean, uh, I like that. and yeah. seeing the diversity, there's a great diversity on Drifting Sands. And I oh, think yes, yes. Strength, don't you think? Yes, yes, it's really nice. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and I saw a lot of mm. wonderful writers and I learned a lot. Yeah. What more could you yeah. ask for? <laughs> true, true. Oh, so shall we go to the next step? Poem that you would like to, uh, you can read for us, maybe. Um, Nevada testing. What is it? Nevada testing. Oh, uh, testing. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I always wonder if I pronounce things right. No, that's Because right. my pronunciation, uh, so I was schooled in India. So my pronunciation is a mix of Indian um, as well as after afterwards when I came to the U.S., uh, you know, it's it's all got uh, quite, I'm, I'm quite a mutt. It's, it's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so. Here's Nevada testing. Mm -hmm. In the 50s, we moved to South Dakota and dad bought a Magnavox TV. The signal blew hot and cold over the plains from Iowa, so he instructed my mother to keep the set on. We woke each morning to a test pattern, watched through a snowy screen, the denotation, the formless rising, and finally the large mushroom cloud the process repeated itself all that hot summer. And the haiku in the middle here is as ordinary as cornflakes and Wonder Bread. We were children. Only at night, when Flash Gordon arrived, 
did we huddle around the TV with our playmates, ray guns, and space wars. Finally, something happened. But can you imagine growing Thank up you. and seeing this every single day on a TV screen? My goodness. Oh, my goodness. Is that what, what had happened? And we had I no mean, idea what it was. I mean, we knew they oh, were terrible. Wow. We didn't know the dangers. We didn't know. Our parents didn't explain it. Yeah. So it was televised, telecasted. Yeah, every single day. Oh, my All goodness. Oh, my goodness. On TV until 5 o'clock at night. Oh, my goodness. And so it would take the whole day for the mushroom cloud. You know, it would go very slowly. And it did some night, some days, of course, it took days as I'm remembering, and I could be misremembering because it took a long time for it to be the mushroom cloud, and it would start over again. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And you know that they actually brought visitors from Iowa and South Dakota to see this? Like it was an attraction? Oh my goodness. I mean, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it, today? Yeah, yeah, wow. It's uh, wow. horrifying, actually. Yeah, yeah. But oh. we with it. Yeah, so a lot of us, um, in English language haiku, uh, you know, all the hygiene, many of us are international and we've just grown up reading about all this yes. or um, even about Martin Luther King and such, you know, uh, or watching clips on the internet because right. we don't. So, um, so, so the hydrogen just, bomb. Uh, sorry? They were testing the hydrogen bomb. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what more do you remember about this this uh, uh, this bomb? And also, then maybe a little bit after that. I mean, that was maybe uh, some years after is uh, Martin Luther King, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. Yeah. I. Um, what do I more remember about the Nevada testing? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, Nevada yeah. testing. Um, I think I remember as a child nothing much more about it and except that it was boring. We had no <laughs> idea how devastating this was and right. we had no idea how the dust was floating down over the yeah. Rocky Mountains, etc. and infecting people and and causing cancer. All yeah. kinds of cancer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Salt Lake City cancer, all can't just all kinds because the dust would float right down. Right. If, if you were in a car driving along, your windshield would be filled with atomic dust. And I only know this because I have a friend who grew up in Utah, and she told me that their car, their windshield would be just filled with with this dust from the atomic dust. dusting. And wow. her mother ended up with cancer, and her grandmother before that. And oh my goodness! It, it did a, a lot of devastation. Okay. Did they uh, talk about all the any dangers afterwards? Well, TV? afterward, as I grew older and I realized oh. what was happening, okay, um, it was devastating, and I read everything I could on it then. And um, Terry Tempest Williams is an author that writes about this, or that did write about this. And I started um, emailing, not emailing, writing to her. We didn't have email, so <laughs> started writing mm -hmm. to her. And also a man who had worked on the whole thing and had written against it, had written mm -hmm. a book. And I wrote to him and asked if he would send his book which I no longer remember, mm -hmm. probably downstairs. And he said, nobody has ever wanted to read this book. And he wow. thanked me for wanting to read it and learn more about it. So I did a lot of research after the fact. 
But as a kid, mm -hmm. I only cared about Flash Gordon. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and and we just wanted that off our TV. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know it's a isn't it something when you think back? When I think back. Yeah. Oh. And to see this all the time and just to be, oh, this is on our TV again. <laughs> yeah, but as kids, what do you know, right? I mean, even even adults probably didn't know much about it. Right? I think so. our parents must have known, but I think that they were all in favor of testing and okay. protecting ourselves against the enemy. Yeah, 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 yeah. In quotes, yeah. You know. Right, right. Uh, so. Right. They probably thought it was great. I, I don't know that. Oh my hearsay, but you know, I mean, not even hearsay. I don't know that. We never talked yeah. about it. Right. Except, you oh know, my they probably said, what is this doing here? And they probably said something like, well, we have to do these tests. We never know. Right. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's sad. <sighs> yeah. So, um, so I have in front of me uh, the next thing, which is of historic importance, and that is MLK uh, time, summer of 67, oh, 1967. Yeah. Yeah. I'll Would you like it. to read that? Yes, please. Yeah, read it. Um, sure. All right. Summer of 1967. In the time of Martin Luther King and Detroit in flames, my children and I gathered around an old upright each night to learn the songs of Pete Seeger. We sang with gusto. We shall overcome. Guantanamera. What side are you on, boys? We mixed peaceful protest with Rogers and Hammerstein's Dichetua, Getting to Know You and Others. The songs wafted out the open windows that hot summer. And after weeks of hearing us, a few of the neighbors began to sing along. Car bombs, broken glass, from the dry grass, a chorus of cicadas. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. This, this was so beautiful. I loved your reference to songs in this one. Uh, even your haiku, uh, the, the rhyming so-called, I mean, it's not really, but glass and grass, oh, it's yeah. the, the sounds, the g sounds, you know, so beautiful, so beautiful. The sounds, uh, yeah. Thank you. You could just yeah. those sounds. Our neighbors used to sit on the curb. <laughs> other at night, but I had to do something with our children, and um, they would actually march along around the living room. The older boy <laughs> leading the other th three children. Uh, uh -huh. they'd, do songs, they'd do it at the piano, and then they would do the marches. Uh -huh. I was trying to teach uh -huh. them about Martin Luther King and yeah. what was going yeah. on. So tell us a little bit more about this time, please. Well, this is a very difficult time in Detroit. Uh, the city was burning, literally burning. The race riots were, they were terrible. They were, mm -hmm. they were, it's exactly car bombs, broken glass, all of that mm -hmm. burning, mm -hmm. burning. And so oh, when I was writing the haiku, I was thinking the dry grass, you know, it, it was like a ready to go up in flames. And the cicadas, exactly. you heard that noise, there was always that sound. Yes. Actually, um, I wrote an essay about this, which I'll send to you for your mm, own. I'll put a link. If, if, there, if there is a somewhere online that is available, I can put a link on the podcast yes, for a, the other listeners. Summer for me as well. I was going through a divorce. I had three children at home. 
There was very little furniture, but we were happy. We had the piano. Mm. We had the piano, and we just really, really enjoyed this. Way, way back when, 50 years ago, I guess. <laughs> yes, I yes 55, yeah. <laughs> but that's who it oh, is. wow. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Detroit. Sometimes was, I feel we've come, we've come a long way, but still a uh, long way to go. A long way to go. And in those days, you know, they, we had a TV. I, we had a black and white TV. Mm -hmm. And I'd have my little boy beside me. And sometimes they would show the writing. And so mm -hmm. I would try to explain about Martin Luther King and what he was trying to do and giving him a feeling for how one person can make a difference. Yes. That, yes, this is what's happening, but this doesn't have to happen. Yes. I don't know how well I did or whatever, but that was my goal. But the singing, the music was important. Mm -hmm. Tell the stories mm -hmm. through the music. Yes. yes. Sorry, I'm talking so much. God. No, it's lovely. Oh my God, I, you've transported me to that time. Mm. It was quite a time. Yeah. But there's another thing that I wanted to, I've been dying to ask you. What? So in 2009, you placed first in the Wisconsin Writers Association J Dream Contest, and you were awarded the Bard's Chair to yes. keep for a year oh my goodness and i saw a picture of that on your website and i was blown away so tell us tell us how did you feel what did the what did the the, the 1800s right uh, late 1800s yeah. chair look like or feel like and what I did you do with it for a year you know it was handmade and it it just felt so good the, you could feel the gnarls and they could feel the, and then the seat was pretty smooth. And on the back, I don't think very many people had had it by then, but they would award that for a year. I got to keep it for two years. And oh. Luckily for me. But you would, um, what do you call that when you inscribe your name on the back? Yeah. We would wood burn our names into the back. So oh, really? Oh, wow. Before me were there. And then I added oh. my name. And the poet that came after me would add their name. Yeah. So there oh, was wow. a whole generational thing. It, it was right. wonderful. I can remember. And, and what did you do with it for, for the year, uh, for the two years? Oh, I, I would carry it sometimes in my writing room because it was small. And it uh -huh. would be with me at night in the bedroom. <laughs> it was my muse, so to speak, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Was, oh, uh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for asking. Oh, that, that I was so impressed. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's not something you get to see uh, every day. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, I'll never see that again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but your name's on it. <laughs> um, so how about reading us the next next poem, uh, Unbroken? That is, uh, yeah. That, that was, was a big poem, too. I mean, a big time. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. up until 2009, I was a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. I had stopped mm -hmm. doing some of it in 2005 when my grandson mm -hmm. died. I would say most of it. But I still yeah. played the piano and I still did performances, though not as many. Mm -hmm. And in 2009, I got throat cancer. Though I never yeah. smoked, um, that's what happened. And yeah. when my husband, and it took a long time to recover, a very, very long time, years. But at the time, when I was in the hospital, uh, I was out of ICU when, it, when this happened, this poem, and I was in the heart 
board for another month. I kept hearing this song, and so I was very happy. I mean, I love Tom Dooley's song. Mm -hmm. And I remember sharing it later with my ENT, and he was laughing. He says, Tom Dooley, what is this about Tom Dooley? You can't hear her. <laughs> Which wasn't very funny, but yeah. um, I thought I could hear her. I thought I was hearing because it was in my head. Yeah. But I had lost my hearing and so therefore lost the life I knew uh, and didn't have a clue how I was going to start over because when I got out of here, got out of this whole thing, I couldn't write a sentence, not even a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I had a very good friend that came over every other day and she would read to me and she would ask me to do the, write one word and I could write a word. And when I wrote my first sentence, it, it was joyful. It took me almost three hours to write that first sentence. Oh and I don't know what made me stick with it, but I have a feeling Tom Dooley is a part of all of this. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> But Do you like to read this? You want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Unbroken. How did a murder ballad, the story of a love triangle, a woman knifed on a mountain, and a man hung for his crime, morph into something other than one of the Kingston Trio's top hits? I first heard Tom Dooley inside a crowded pub in Detroit after i just turned 21. The song sprung me right out of my body. The soft, moderate tempo, the hypnotic rhythm, the catchy tune. The audience clinked glasses, pounded on tables. One of our guys hoisted himself on a tabletop, waving a white handkerchief. How giddy I felt then, a girl with nothing to lose. When I next heard the Kingston Trio, I was in my 60s, in the hospital. One day, out of nowhere, the trio began singing Tom Dooley and never stopped. Even after I left the hospital and came home, the singing did not stop. Such soft, easy listening, but still, it was then my husband gently told me that I'd lost my hearing and that the music is in your head. Since then, I've wondered why this particular song decided to take up residence in my brain, to be my constant companion. Could it be that in losing what I most loved, my music, my brain compensated with a ballad of permanent loss to match my own? Or did my brain select this tune with its upbeat cadence to urge me to choose life over and over again? Synaptic Leaps Maya Gaberia surfs the moon across decades. It seemed like that synaptic leap. I was a classical pianist. How did I go to Tom Dooley? <laughs> but do you know? No, this is such an such an evocative poem. I, well, well, actually, when I read it, the words were stuck in my throat. I mean, I. The, the connection of the hanging, the loss of such an important ability for a musician oh. and therefore the connection of uh, Maya Gabagia uh, surfing, all yeah. those subtle connections, so subtle but forceful, brilliant. brilliant. She was such a wonderful model, don't you think? I mean, the, the yeah. only woman she read, the, I mean, the only person, period, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I yeah. should read my yeah. notes here. 
the largest wave ever ridden by a man or a woman. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's something like what you've done. You know, you are the story of the brave, the <laughs> phoenix. <laughs> oh, no. It was, well, you know, I think that this hearing the music in my head was a wonderful transition to deafness. If there is a wonderful transition, you know, I don't want to over coat this because it really is no fun. I will be honest. I, I really miss my music. Mm -hmm. But here's Tom Dooley playing at night when I go to bed. It's amazing grace. And it just starts playing oh. in my head. Wow. And then wow. this music in my head was 24 hours because the brain doesn't like a vacuum, I suppose. Um, it was playing 24 hours, and I could make it play after a while, anything I wanted, even classical music. And sometimes it would play too fast, and I could slow it down. I learned how to, to slow the speed. And, and my granddad, here's a funny one. I also had sirens that would go off when I got anxious or excited. My goodness. Sirens, like a real siren. <laughs> and my granddaughter, one time we were in a, this is long after, maybe a couple of years, we were in the uh, parking lot and it was just jammed. And Abby said to me, Grandma, are your sirens going off? <laughs> the, <laughs> the kids are, you know. Oh, Grandma's sirens, it must be bad. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah. Wow. So, uh, how how is your hearing loss and your relationship with music and connection with music in the poems? Do you feel the music in your poems have increased afterwards? You know, I'm not sure, but I know that it's really important to me, and I feel like it's. Uh, Poetry is the music of words. Mm. Right. I don't think of poetry without music. Does that? I don't know if that answers your question, but no, I I get it. I get it. But yeah. you, you know, in yeah. poetry or in haiku, let's say, let's take a haiku. The music is different. It's a euphony. It's the sound. It's that pleasing sound. Um. Mm. For instance, let me find one here of my own where I can help. Oh, if you take, I mean, this is a, a, a pretty haiku, but if I take that one with the car bombs, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. an example of music. Yeah. You know, so you have, you have car bombs, you have car, chorus, cadence. Yeah. So you have that heart yeah. sound which goes with this hard, high, high bone. Really. Yeah. And then you have bombs, broken. So you have an alliteration, and you have right. glass and, and grass. Rest. So all of this euphemy creates a musical landscape for me that mm -hmm. is filled with hard things but yet is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Can I say that? Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, the way you put it, it's uh, it's so good to hear you just say all these things, Joe. It's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. just, yeah. there's so much music in haiku, and I think my bad haiku don't have any music. <laughs> Do you write bad haiku? Of course, many, many bad haiku. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all write? <laughs> we do. I do, definitely. <laughs> if we don't write bad haiku, we can never get a good one. This is true. This is true. Yeah, you know, just it's to get true. one good haiku in your whole life, wouldn't that be something? That was just <laughs> perfect. That will probably never happen. And I say that because when I was performing for years and years and years, there are only about three performances that I considered perfect out of all the performances. 
there was always something that could be better. And it, uh -huh. it's good. I mean, that's just the way it is. But that, and then maybe that's what's so wonderful about haiku is that it's so organic. Yes. You know, it, it's going along with us as we grow. Right. And the music is growing and the music changes as we grow older, as we get into different situations. Yeah. But that, there's always this musical landscape, no matter what else is going on for me. Mm. And I, I guess I'm just grateful. That's all I can say. <laughs> and so are we to read all the all your creations. It's it's when, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you um, for this opportunity. <laughs> Would you like to read uh, the next one, uh, "Making Memories"? I loved that one. Please. Wh which one? Making memories. Oh, making memories, Grandma. That was Grandma. Haiku, our first haiku I ever sent into Drifting Sounds. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. That's a, that I ever sent, period, right? Making <laughs> memories. On a sunny morning in late spring, I sit at Grandma's table. A warm blackberry breeze teases the yellow gingham curtains. On the counter of the old enamel sink, Berries and rhubarb drain in a mesh colander. Our pie is for dinner. Grandma wears her checked apron. I watch her dust the breadboard with flour. As she kneads the dough, she talks to me about her girlhood in County Clare, even the bad things that happened. Sometimes she sings her songs her mother taught her. When the dough is ready, she puts it in a bowl by the window, lays a cloth over it, and comes to the table. I stir Ovaltine, and Grandma pours coffee. I watch her put her face into the steam, and I do the same. We are best friends. I want to be just like her when I grow up. Later today, we will have barn brack. She'll bake the loaves in the wood stove. The kitchen already smells of lemon and tea-soaked raisins from the sun. We keep talking, and I listen to Grandma laugh. She loves to laugh. Chasing butterflies on the burn, she might see fairies. On other mornings, Grandma puts me in charge of the toaster. She says it is the old-fashioned kind with doors. She teaches me how to turn the bread without burning myself. It's very tricky, but Grandma says that I'm old enough. Next year, I'll be in kindergarten. I'm pretty sure I'm her favorite. Today, in my own kitchen, I open the curtains. It's a sunny morning in late spring with a warm breeze through the window. I'm happy. It will always be so on a fine morning like this. I close my eyes and see her, hear her laugh, smell the yeast rising, and know that somewhere a grandmother is showing another small girl how to find and taste joy. From the Menarda, a bumblebee buzz. Grandpa in the raspberries. Uh, I love this one. Your love for poetry, musicality, your grandparents comes through so beautifully. Uh, you know, I believe that our relationships with our grandparents are always so special, isn't it? I mean, um, do, do you know about her journey from Ireland to the U.S.? Oh, it was a hard Did journey you? Uh, because it was during the potato. Well, her grandparent, her parents, 
actually her grandparents had had, had um, they were there during the potato famine. And then her parents came over on the boat and they went first to Canada. And then they ended up in Laramie, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up in North Dakota. He was a farmer. Well, they mm -hmm. lost everything in Ireland, everything. And uh, my grandma would tell me about, um, you know, feeding the sheep and even meeting some of the boys. <laughs> she would, I, could, I mean, not bad stuff, but as a little kid, I thought, oh, this is so good, you know, <laughs> telling me all these songs. And she sang, you know, when I was a little girl, I mean, tiny, we lived above my grandparents. And my grandmother was a concert pianist, and my grandfather was a concert violinist. And so she would rock me at, at various times, and she'd sing twirl -or 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 and Take Me Home Again, Kathleen, and she would, all these different songs that we know, and songs I don't even remember. And on the other hand, she taught the choir Gregorian chant in those days. So I grew up between the two of them, <laughs> and um, I, I will never forget those days in the rocker because it was the motion of the rocker and her voice and the songs. It was always the music. When I think back, it's always the music. Wow. Oh, I was so lucky. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we come to the next poem of yours. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about the Darkening River? Oh, Darkening River, yes. It's a somber poem. I will um, talk so about poignant. That. Darkening River. Um, in our family, we did not know about it, but we have a genetic disease called mitochondrial disease. And it is a disease of the cells. So if you have a car with a dead battery, you're not going to go very far. And many mm. of the cells, each cell has a mitochondria. Yeah. And yeah. if it's bad, the cell doesn't work. Yeah. When you get enough of that, it affects the, the stomach or the heart or some some area, some organ that it manifests itself in and eventually right. the system. So my two grandsons died from it and my daughter has it and she was in hospice when I wrote this. She was at home when I wrote this, but she went into hospice shortly after that. But she is a very persistent girl and though she lives a difficult life, she is still alive. Oh. But I didn't know that when I wrote this poem. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's the background pain. of it. And yeah. she, she was actually dying, and she went to hospice from this and graduated. Isn't that something? So darkening. <sighs> Today I spend the afternoon with my daughter. She is downstairs on the sofa, shivering, covered with blankets, <clears throat> her eyes closed. I lay my hand on her head. Intermittently, I read or write in my journal while stroking the side of her face, her hair. She doesn't talk much, has tears when I leave. Deteriorating house, a lone dragonfly, spirals down. There is nowhere I can go from her presence. Chopping celery for tuna salad, I think how she chose that salad for her bridal shower. She cannot eat it now, cannot make it for herself. Pouring a glass of wine, reminds me of her favorite place on the ocean. She will never see it again. 
I bring back chicken broth. She takes small sips. I will remember this, too. Cloud cover. The sun slips in, slips out. This is so beautiful, so beautiful, so touching, poignant. Thank you. And I can feel the pain. I can feel the pain through your words. It was hard, but thank yeah, goodness but for you came through. It. Yeah. And I show her this now. I showed her this the other day. Uh -huh. All she could say was, oh, mom, oh, mom. <laughs> so it was, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for sitting with me and reading all these, all these brilliant and touching poems. What a beautiful afternoon this has turned out to be. <laughs> I, I am so grateful, really, really grateful that I could talk with you. I uh, just, I've enjoyed this so much, I can't even tell you. And it's inspired. <laughs> you inspire me. <laughs> you inspire me. <laughs> yes, to think that's such a, such a beautiful venture. Ah, but yeah. before leaving, would yeah. you like to close with reading a poem that has appeared in the March issue of uh, oh. DSH this year? Oh. Breath. Oh, breath. Breath. Okay. Sure. Oh, it's beautiful. It's um, beautiful. Well, that would be a great everything in order, um, but you know how that is. Okay. <laughs> the noise rises an octave, then dims with lowered lights. Silence weighs in. Spotlights focus on a glossy concert grand, grown larger on the bare stage. From the wings. Her heart thumping, hands clammy, she walks across the wood floor, footsteps loud in her ears. The teacher had instructed her to go around the black bench from left. She got it wrong, and her mouth fills with the metallic taste of fear. The girl is 10 years old, her first subscription concert. She adjusts the bench at the right height and distance from the keyboard, places her hands in her lap, takes the deep breaths practiced now for months. In playing these 24 preludes of Chopin, each with a different mood, she enters the overpowering smell of lilies at great-grandfather's funeral. The creamy taste of soft serve at family picnics. That time the ice cracked as she skated on the lake. Or now playing the raindrop prelude. The quiet but steady drops that fell from the gutter into the rain barrel. Remembering the joy her blind grandmother expressed in that tiny plop. She begins with the first prelude, the buttercups and wild strawberries in the meadow near her house. A gust of white petals, spring's variation on snow. Yeah, my mother wrote down everything that I had said way back when, which was news to me and very happy to get it because I wouldn't remember what a 10 year old remembers, you know. I'd like to thank Jo again for taking time off her day uh, to sit with me and talk Haibun. Today's reading featured poems from Drifting Sands, Haibun Today and Contemporary Haibun Online. I'm sure you'd like to know more about Jo's poetry, her books, her awards. All this information is available at her website, Mary Jo Balistrieri Poet.
all one word, dot com. The music for Ripples in the Sand is from Gran Art by Richard Gran. This podcast is produced by Richard Grant. This is Sangeeta Kalarikal. Thank you for listening.